Hello everybody, this is Women's Grandmaster Sabina Foisher. Welcome back to Day to Day Chess. It's been a really long time since I made these recordings, mostly because of a health issue. And then uh, US Women's Championship uh, took place and um, I kind of uh, neglected my uh, weblog and my YouTube channel. But it's time to get back um, in business. And um, I would like to let you know that, you know, I participated in the U.S. Women's Championship. I am very happy with my result. After about four to five months break, I um, finished fourth, fifth, you know, um, in the U.S. Women's Chess Championship. Definitely a good result for me. Um, I perform much better than in any other year. So um, <laughs> it might be good to take breaks from chess from time to time. And um, I've decided to share with you uh, my last round of the tournament. I was playing white against uh, Bikovtsev Agata, a young uh, and very talented chess player who has uh, won, I believe, last year or maybe, um, uh, two, maybe two years ago as well, the world... Uh, uh, he, she finished second in the world youth... Um, chess championship under 16 so a very strong and promising chess player um, and I had white and of course I wanted to win so let's see what happened in the game I kind of um, I knew that she's very well prepared um, theoretically and this young chess players these days they are very strong so you have to be <laughs> you have to be well prepared as well if um, if you want to have uh, a chance in the opening, otherwise you might find yourself um, caught in the opening. So that was definitely not something that I wanted to happen. And so I've decided to surprise her a little bit myself and went for bishop g5 in this position. Um, now the idea of this um, of this bishop g5 is to kind of take it slow, you know, just say. Okay, you're playing the King's Indian, but I've got two central pawns, and I'm going to play e3, develop my bishop, you know, castle sure, but I maintain my center, um, c4 and d4, and let's see how you're going to um, play here with black. And my opponent um, immediately went for h6. You would normally see people castling here. And then uh, whether white is going to play e3 or e4, that's something of, um, of white's choice. And um, um, again, black's plan is just to play a normal king's Indian. Knights will go to d7 and then either c5 or e5. Definitely this center needs to be broken. So uh, my opponent chose to go h6 in this position, however, and of course we do not want to give away the bishop in f6. So I went bishop h4, g5, bishop g3. Now very often you're hearing that uh, pawns should not be moved um, very much in the opening. So definitely don't make more than two, three moves in the opening because um, you are slowing down your development. Well here, however, she has... Um, Chase my bishop away, so just um, it w these moves were with tempo, so it's not really like she lost moves um, making pawn moves. She didn't lose any any time, but now clearly black has to be a little bit careful about castling short because any time white will have the opportunity of playing some h4 and open up or opening up the h file. Additionally, something very important to note when h6 g5 have been played, this diagonal, b1, h7, has been weakened, so white could consider, you know, keeping it open, bringing the bishop to d3, maybe going to c2, queen d3, in case you castle short, you really need to be on the look for queen h7 mate. But anyways, um, why would black castle short now, right? Black has the opportunity of castling long as well. So, um, here, my opponent went for knight h5, saying, okay, I chased your bishop away, and I chased it away for a reason. I want to capture your bishop in g3, and um, at least I'll have the bishop pair. I weakened my position a little bit. Maybe I stayed a little bit behind in development, 
but uh, the position isn't in such a way that it will get opened easily. So the fact that my king as black is in the center doesn't matter that much. So here, I, I have obviously no way to get my bishop uh, to, to escape with my bishop, so I finish my development. e3. My opponent didn't hurry because the bishop doesn't go anywhere. Black can capture in g3 whenever she wants to. She went for e6. And here I played in knight to d2. Maybe not the best move in the position. Uh, I should be finishing up my development, right? Bishop d3. Well, what's this knight d2? But I just wanted to make sure I am um, figuring out what she's going to do with the knight. And of course, if you play knight h5, you don't play knight h5 to go back to f6. You play knight h5 to capture the bishop. Taking towards the center is what we learn. And here my opponent finished our development. Of course, she doesn't want to castle short, right? Let's remember the b1h7 diagonal. So I finish my development with bishop g3, knight f6, a very nice, um, I, I could say maneuvering, but it's not really maneuvering, but it's just improving the position of the knight, and f6 is definitely a good spot, bringing the knight to the protection of h7. And here I went queen e2, just finishing up the development. Some people might go queen c2, but I really liked in, uh, my queen in e2, because sometimes if I push the pawn and my queen can get um, to e4, that would be amazing. Or other times if your knight is being moved from here, I want my queen to have the opportunity, oopsie, I'm sorry, to get somewhere to h5. That would be really great. So I wanted to keep my queen um, more looking on the king side than on the queen side. If I ever want to start attacking on the queen side, I can definitely move it back. It's not a big deal. Queen e7. And here I cast along. Obviously, I want to keep my options open about the h file in case black still cast on short, which is still, of course, a possibility. Then I want to have my rook opened and, you know, possibly have some sacrifices in h6 at some point or maybe some g4, f4, capturing g5 and the h file would get open. So my king is going to go to safety, can go to b1, a1 anytime. Bishop d7, a very natural developing move. I stayed for a second. And here my opponent should have castle long. Of course, she finished the development, uh, but now she has to figure out where to put the king, and now it was the right moment to castle long, and then figure out how she's going to uh, do something about the center, because for the moment I have the activity in the center. I've got two pawns. So eventually she will have to prepare some e5. But she hurried in this position. She went for e5 immediately. And the reason this move is not the best move um, in the position is that she's giving away something, the f5 square. And I always say in my videos when I have the opportunity that you have to be very careful about your pawns. You know, if um, you move a pawn, you have to remember, and of course it's very logical, that it never goes back. But when you're playing, you mostly think about what you want to do in that particular moment, and you forget about the long-term weaknesses that you might create in the position. And if your opponent does the right thing, those long-term weaknesses could prove to be really in their favor. So this was um, a big... Um, not super big, but definitely a uh, uh, positional mistake, giving away the f5 square. And you're going to see uh, the way the game progressed, how I was able to utilize that square. I went 94. I like this move a lot. I have seen it in, in a lot of games. Maybe in this position I could have captured, and then if she takes with the pawn, now go 95. This would be a typical um, thing to do for white. Um, in the King's Indian. But I've decided to just stick to knight d to e4 because now I realize that by playing e5 that bishop gets closed a little bit as well and if I, I, uh, I pay attention I can just keep it closed the way it is. And here she casts along. Now of course black cannot consider capturing here because we simply take knight f6 check. And whenever the queen captures back, we go knight d5, a very good move, attacking both those two places. 
and now we capture back and black has remained with the king in the center and although the position opened up uh, white pieces are much better than the bishop pair so she castled and here I captured in f6 queen takes f6 and d5 now I am slowly trying to close up this bishop in g7 because obviously you cannot give away a pawn and um, yeah I'm I just have some g4 ideas and then you know try to find a way to utilize that f5 square maybe I'll bring my knight e4 g3 towards f5 trading the light square bishop and then remaining a very nice knight in f5 against that bishop in g7 that would be amazing so um Seeing this threat, my opponent decided to stop it by playing g4. But this was a very big mistake. And you're going to see in a second why. Instead, she had to go h5. Um, h5 in order to stop me from playing g4 and then um, trying to keep her pawns linked this way. So that neither of them is going to be um, remaining weak. What happened after g4 is that I immediately went through h5, which is a really, really nice move, stabilizing the position with a weakness in h6. Um, with my bishop already controlling f5, now I'm bringing another piece controlling f5. So if you move your queen um, to think I'm going to be playing f5 next, well, you won't because I can place my bishop in f5. Trade my bad bishop, given that this pawn is on light square um, and then um, you know you you've got this pawn in g4 that might be hanging you've got that pawn in h6 that is going to keep your bishop passive in g7 so this is definitely in white's favor um, so it's very tough to play from here on white's plan is you know just try to keep you that way trade slowly the pieces that are worse in that case the bishop if i trade queens that should be fine as well and then as soon as i stabilize everything on the king side, I can open up the position on the queen side and um, get active. And that's basically my plan in the position. Always stop and think what it is that you want to do in a position. Don't just, um, don't just make moves. Make sure you have some idea behind your moves. Now, uh, my opponent went um, rook d to g8. She, she found some interesting idea in order to try to now move the bishop and bring the rook to try to trade this rook in h5 because you see if she had played h5 I would never have had this opportunity but like this I made sure I stabilized the position and now you know these two pawns um, are not easy to protect. Queen c2, bishop f8 trying to play rook g5 it's okay I'm trading my bad bishop looking at my pawns that's definitely my bad bishop and although black doesn't have so much space I'm okay with the trade. Now I went rook d to h1, making sure even if you know I capture back with the rook there won't be any h5 to try for black to get that bishop active. She captured queen takes, queen d7. Well, that's okay. I don't need to trade because if you trade here, I'll capture back with the rook. And again, you cannot play h5 because you'll be losing a pawn. So now all I need to do is make sure that these pawns are going to remain there so that your bishop remains closed without uh, very much activity. Rook g6. Well, it's an endgame. It's about time to bring my king towards the center. My opponent decided to, you know, play king d8. Maybe now the queen can get active. So I told myself, I'll just trade it. And now um, I went for rook f5, just to make sure there will never be any possibility for black to play f5. And once again, let's not forget, having my rook in h1 and this rook here, h5 is not possible. So like that, I'm maintaining those two weaknesses. King e7, king towards the center. Now, um, I didn't want to start pushing the pawns on the queen side with my knight in e4, because I thought if at some point I move it, black will be able to open up this bishop. So instead of that... I thought of moving the knight right now, rook to c8, I went back rook h5, she played rook f8 to try to push f5, and I went for e4. 
e4 for black here obviously would not be possible because I'm just capturing that pawn. Uh, I can capture it with both the knight or the king. Probably I would go with the knight. And then, you know, even if your bishop gets active, you know, this is not the kind of active that you want to get with black because your b7 pawn is going to be hanging and then suddenly I've created two more weaknesses. So, and your bishop still doesn't do much. It just captured the pawn. So I made sure I made this maneuvering at the right time. Look, I chained. Now my knight does not place the best in c3. I definitely want to find a better spot for it. And since we've got a weakness here and that f5 spot that we remember from a long time ago, it's about time to bring our knight this way. Knight d1. Rook f5 check. King d7, knight e 3 um, Again. Black is really stuck, so most of the moves, they are just moves that have to be made. You have to realize how wonderful this position is for white. And no pushes are actually going to help black here, because I don't do anything. You can play c6 if you want. I'm not going to touch, I'm not going to touch the c6 pawn. Bishop f6. My opponent found a really nice way to get her bishop a little bit active. But I made sure she wasn't going to play bishop g5 because this pawn is hanging. King d7. Now I have a little threat, so if you just make some random move here, I can just play knight f5 and then capture in h6. So you have to move the king to avoid um, checks in f5. Now if I play knight f5, then bishop goes to g5. And uh, it looks like black has managed to kind of keep the position a little bit together. I mean, I, I have no way of winning any of these pawns. So I told myself, it, I prefer to keep my knight here because the bishop in f6 does much less than it does in g5. So I can keep it in e3 to keep that g4 pawn attacked so that this g6 rook is forced to stay and protect the pawn. So I went for b4. All my pieces are staying perfectly, so it's about time to find a way to open up the position on the queen side b6 and here I went for c5 I didn't want to wait for any longer of course my fiance who is a very strong grandmaster told me that you know I should have been a little bit more careful that I gave my opponent uh, counterplay and so did my mom who's also a very strong um, chess player men's international master so they were saying you know you're better off trying to Play this knight f5, although you didn't really like it, and then maybe bring your king to c3, and then this rook could come to b1, and you know your opponent is stuck. And if you want, you can play some a4 as well. But uh, I thought I was ready for the opening up of the position. I definitely have more space here. All the pieces are stuck. I can bring this rook into play anytime I want. And I was quite proud of this uh, positional pawn sacrifice because, look, I've basically given away a pawn, but black's pawn structure on the queen side is completely destroyed. And the position didn't open up in such a way that this bishop would actually get active. So now I went for rook b1 because I know that any time I want, I will be able to capture that pawn back. I just didn't want to hurry. I wanted to make sure this rook is not going to get active on the B file. So my opponent decided to protect it. And here, again, I didn't try to uh, to give my opponent counterplay. For example, if I take here, maybe this rook would come to B6, um, trade, maybe uh, get a better pawn structure. Instead, I played knight C4. Just making sure that, you know, my opponent wants rook B6. Okay, my knight is coming. Controlling the b6 square, but also um, attacking this e5 pawn. So again, if at some point, God forbid, I make a mistake, you know, I would still um, be able to at least, you know, um, get uh, a pawn back and I won't be losing or something. So, knight c4, f6. Um, now, of course, rook b7. It's about time to get even more active. This rook has to go to a8. And here I play rook h1. I thought, you know, it's not really necessary to keep my rook there anymore because 
now with that rook gone, h5 is not really possible. And this rook is still stuck for the moment. So my opponent played rook g8, which I found a very, very, you know, good idea to trade my active piece and try to get the rook active on the b file. I took the pawn, rook b8. And here I'm not the most proud of my move. I, um, I actually captured me b8 because I thought I'm winning and that rook getting active won't do very much. Um, I'm very happy with the way I played the game so far, but here definitely rook b3 was the move that had to be played because if you want to trade, that's fine. I'll just take back with the pawn and the b file is closed. The rook won't have, won't have any activity and I can just simply come and capture your pawn. Um, the knight can come back to e3 as well. But um, somehow I thought that this is fine. Rook takes, rook g6. My opponent got her rook active to b1, a very good choice. And here I play knight e3. Uh, no, sorry, I didn't play knight e3. I captured in g4. And she went rook a1, attacking my pawn. And I found f4, which I was very happy about because... Even if I'm opening up the position now, I really need my pawns to start being pushed. Obviously, I could try to play some a3 to keep my pawn and then consider to play f4 later. But I thought there's no time for that. Um, and the a pawn is not going to be a dangerous pawn. So, you know, when you make decisions, think how your opponent is going to, uh, to react, how much counterplay your opponent is going to have. Uh, after playing your moves, and if you see that that won't be very much, then you should be you should be okay with with your move. But if you see that um, your opponent could get some counterplay, try to stop that and um, later do your plan. Um, so um, there are some um, there are some other ideas here. Maybe instead of rook a1 for black to give check, and then after king c2 to think of some rook d4. Um, but the problem with this is although your rook does get active, my knight can get active as well. And I was thinking to bring it to c6. This would be a really nice outpost. And if you're worried that black might play f5 in this position, I don't think you should be. Because of this bad bishop, unfortunately, rook g7 is just going to be winning for white. Because knight c6 is coming next and there's going to be... Well, either a double attack or that bishop is going to be lost. So no need to worry about this rook getting, um, trying to create some little tactical ideas. So after f4, my opponent captured. f takes e5. f takes e5. Knight takes. Check. King c8. And after knight c6, my opponent resigned. Because now um, you don't really have a good spot for the bishop. If you go bishop d6 here, I can go e5 and the bishop is going to be lost. So this was my final round of the U.S. Um, Women's Championship this year. And um, like I said, I finished um, equal, fourth, fifth. And um, yeah, um, I'm. Um, it was one of the strongest U.S. Championships that I've played in. And... Um, this um, youngsters have definitely um, a lot of knowledge in um, in theory, so we have to be working more and more if we really want to have chances um, to keep winning. Well, older older generation to win the U.S. championship. But um, anyways, this was my game. I really hope you enjoyed it, and stay tuned for more tomorrow. Thank you.